Welcome to the 36th virtual worship service of Crabtree Valley Baptist Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. We welcome you to our church home, and it is still home to us, even though we're not able to be here on Sunday morning. We still think of this as our church home, and we pray as you listen to our service that you will feel that it's your church home and you can identify with us. If it is your first time joining us, we hope that you will continue to uh, tune in every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock to hear our worship service. Um, to our church friends, we pray that you've had a good week and that you will keep in touch with us and let us know about any special needs you may have during the week. As I mentioned last Sunday, a lot of upcoming events are taking place in the next few weeks. November and December, and December is fast approaching. We hope you'll refer to your newsletter to keep up with all these happenings. And if you've not received a newsletter, just let the secretary know and she'll be glad to see that you get one. Um, we, uh, we try to keep everything posted in the newsletter so you, you can stay a step ahead of what's happening next. Uh, today is the last day for approval for the safety guidelines for the use of our church facility and the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship proposal to use one of the rooms in our church for the office for their newly uh, appointed coordinator. Um, so if you have any more concerns about it, please let me know today. Otherwise, we will assume that those proposals which have been made to you are approved and we will proceed to contact the um, the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship about the space and also the Toastmasters and the Gamblers Anonymous. Those two groups had asked about joining again, about coming again to our church for meetings as they have done for many, many years. Um, they responded when we asked in March that they discontinue meeting here until the COVID situation was over. And we did not have any idea in March that we would still be bound by COVID limitations. The deadline for delivering our Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child Boxes is fast approaching. You should have them here in the church by 
Thursday, November 19th. That's this coming Thursday by 3 p.m. That's when the secretary leaves for the day. So if you uh, have not brought yours in by Thursday, 3 p.m., uh, if you have a key, you can bring it in. If not, you can contact me or someone who does have access to the building and uh, we will try to accommodate you. Uh, they will be picked up from our church to deliver to the um, place where they will be shipped off uh, on Monday afternoon. And when you prepare your boxes, don't forget to enclose $9, which is the postage charge for each box. If you're doing several boxes, you can enclose one check in, in one box and um, it will be accountable. Um, Monday, November 23rd is the deadline for delivering your crafts and baked goods to the church for inclusion in our Christmas craft sale. If that's a fundraiser for our youth. As you know, they're having all kind of fundraisers to make money for their summer camp in next June or July. Monday, November 30 is the beginning date for the craft sale. You may come in to the church anytime between nine and three on November 30 through December uh, 6 are the beginning dates for the craft sale. December 6 is a Sunday. That is the day for our, um, our drive-through luncheon. And there will be someone in the church who can assist you with your crafts on that day from 11 to 1. If you have any questions about the crafts or the way that the sale is to be set up, please contact Ashley Walker, who is our youth director. November 22nd is the deadline for our approval, your approval, of uh, the deacon's recommendation to use the benevolent funds money from November 29th, January 31st, and May 30th. Those are the next fifth Sundays in the coming months. The deacons are recommending that these funds be transferred to the youth fund to cover, help cover their expenses for the 2021 camp. In the absence of a pastor, we have not been responding to requests for expenditures from our benevolence fund. Please let me know your opinion about this recommendation by Sunday, November 22nd. If you do not wish to have your benevolent fund contribution transferred to the youth fund, you may mark on your offering envelope, benevolent fund only. Sunday, November 29th will mark the beginning of Advent and each service from November 29th to Christmas Eve will include the lighting of the Advent candle for that week. The first candle is the Hope Candle. If you would like to participate in this lighting service, please contact me by next week uh, to let me know if you would like to, to be a part of this service. I can provide you with the message that you would be uh, relating to the congregation and you present the message and you light the candle. There are two people that will be needed for each service. So I have three dates open. So if six people are willing to volunteer, that will be fine. Otherwise, I will be contacting people to ask them to join us in doing that. December 6, which is actually only three weeks away from today, is our next drive through luncheon hosted by the youth. The cost of the luncheon, which includes desserts and utensils, is $10 per plate. The youth will use these funds also for their summer camp. They had a very successful uh, luncheon last month, and we hope that, that this time will be just as successful for them. Um, those of you who came before, you be sure to tell your friends about it, your friends and neighbors, and encourage them to come. This time it will be a Mexican luncheon, which will be prepared by one of our members. An authentic Mexican lunch. Um, you may come and pick the lunch up and take it home or wherever you'd like to take it, or you can park in our parking lot and eat there. There would be no problem in your doing that. Uh, there will not be any beverages served, so you would have to bring a beverage with you when you come. And remember, you can also do your Christmas shopping from the crafts that the youth and the members of the church are putting together. 
Let's remember in prayer our church family during these coming days. Again, I would mention if you have any special needs or concerns or you are aware of someone who does, please let your deacon know or me or the church office. Our church is and will continue to be a body of believers who love and care about each other. It's so very, very important right now that we are not in church, that we continue to be church by staying connected with one another. This morning, we welcome Dr. Trey Davis, of a North Carolina native and graduate of Davidson, Wake Forest University, and Duke University. Uh, Dr. Davis is back with us this morning. He was with us in October, and we enjoyed hearing him, and we're so glad you're back again today, Trey. And we also welcome Trey's daughter, Audrey, with us today. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. and. Now, I recognize Jean Sherwood, one of our deacons, who will be reading our scripture for today. Please join us in singing, We Praise You, O God, Our Redeemer. The words will appear on your screen. scripture readings today. The first is Genesis chapter 2 verses 4 through 8. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no one to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil.
Once again, it is good to be with you and to worship with you uh, wherever you may be. Thank you for having me back here to Crabtree Valley. May we pray. Dear God, often when we come to you, our spirits are troubled. We come when we are unsure about which steps to take, when we are vexed beyond belief, when our anger has reached its boiling point, when we are drenched with sorrow. We come to you when we cannot find the words to express why our souls ache, because we know that you will understand us even if we cannot articulate our grief, our frustration, or our lament. Sometimes coming to you assuages our concerns and calms our fears, but sometimes when we come to you, we remain agitated, distressed, or lost. We wish that it were not this way, but honesty compels us to admit that it is. We are eager to do good, but the wisdom to discern goodness often eludes us. Likewise, eschewing fear and intimidation is easier said than done. Your texts make it sound so simple, and yet our lives suggest otherwise. We have waded into deep water. It began peaceful and beautiful, but now the waters overcome us. They are turbulent, churning, powerful, unpredictable, and everywhere. We yearn to float, but we cannot keep our heads above the waves. We struggle because we long to be in control, to determine our own outcomes, to rest assured that we are the masters of our fortune and our success. Floating requires us to let go, to relax, to embrace peace and to trust that something mightier than we are can sustain us and lift us up. Help us to release the illusion of control and to float above the white caps. We struggle because we are combative, constantly looking for an opponent to defeat. We paint in black and white, good and evil, success and failure, because those are terms that are easier for us to wrap our brains around and because the dichotomies they set up make for a clear winner and loser. Even as our world proclaims, we're all in this together, we find ourselves separate. Help us to embrace each other in your uniting love, seeking not victory, but harmony. Even though we are isolated, we are not alone. We have been promised that we will not be orphaned. Help us to grab hold of that promise to know that your spirit connects us, surrounds us, wells up deep inside us, and breathes life into us. And even if we do these things, we know that there is a chance that we might go under the water, but help us not to fear this, and instead to trust that we will rise up again, and when we do, we will see the world differently, changed for the better. We ask these things because of your son, who calmed stormy weather and trod upon deep waters, who let go of control even though he didn't have to, who diffused tension and anger with a single simple sentence or action, and who brought people together long ago and brings us together now. We give thanks for this man, Jesus, for his patience and sacrifice, and for his love. Amen.
The second reading is Acts chapter 11, verses 24 through 28. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as some of our as some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. I have three daughters, and all of them are dancers. All three are in ballet classes, so a significant chunk of our week as a family is focused on dance. I would guess that dance is the part of the week they look forward to the most, or at least close to the most. It's where they've made friends, where they get exercise, where they feel challenged, where they laugh, where they find a sense of fulfillment. Obviously then, when the virus hit last spring and the whole world came crashing to a halt, they lamented the loss of dance rehearsals and performances about as much as anything. My oldest daughter, Caroline, was at a final rehearsal for her spring performance back in March when she got word that it wouldn't be happening after all. It was a tremendously upsetting evening for all of the dancers and the parents who were gathered, and that was eight months ago. To its credit, the dance studio, like most of us, found a way to continue. My wife trekked to the hardware store and came home with various lengths of PVC pipe to build a dance bar that now sits in our dining room my daughters assemble it to use for practice, mimicking the moves that their instructors demonstrated on the computer screen. It wasn't ideal, but it was better than nothing. A few months later, the studio announced that they would be reopening their doors for in-person rehearsals with numerous modifications to their normal practices. Dancers would have temperature checks before entering the building, the break room where kids snacked and lunched between practices would be closed. Students would have a large square marked out on the floor, each square at least six feet away from any other square, and the dancers would have to remain distanced in their own squares throughout the rehearsals. And then, of course, everything was being heavily sanitized throughout the day. We felt pretty good about all of these precautions. We were ready to send our girls back to in-person lessons, much to their delight. There was one thing that we questioned. The studio announced that everyone would be wearing a mask from the moment they stepped into the building until the moment they departed. While we were grateful for the attempts to keep everyone safe, we weren't confident this would actually work. Dance is strenuous and active. We couldn't imagine someone wearing a mask while at the gym for an hour or while going on a run. Caroline sometimes has lessons that last all day, especially during the summertime camps that the studio runs. As she prepared to go into the studio for the first time in a long time, we asked Caroline, are you going to be able to breathe? Breathing isn't something that we spend a ton of time thinking about. Of all the things that are essential to my life, breathing is the one I take for granted the most. If I had to concentrate on every time I drew air into my lungs, held it there for the briefest of moments, and then slowly let it go, I'd never get anything else done. I don't say this about many things, but it's probably good that we take breathing for granted, at least a little bit. Lately, of course, the act of breathing has been forced into our consciousness a little bit more. 
as news of the virus broke and we learned what this disease can do, we developed a heightened sense and preoccupation with the need for ventilators. We reacted, sometimes forcefully and fearfully, when people around us coughed, aware of others' breaths as much as we were of our own. After George Floyd's death, I Can't Breathe shifted from carrying the weight of the virus to becoming a mantra for an entirely different movement, one concerned with justice and equality. And during the past couple of weeks, as our nation's focus turned to the election, I heard more than one pundit exhort its, his viewers to be patient and to just breathe while we waited for results. In 2020, we no longer have the luxury of breathing subconsciously. We have to prepare for it, to fight for it, to pursue it intentionally. We have to make ourselves breathe. In our scriptures, there is a subtle but critical emphasis on breathing. It starts in Genesis right at the very beginning as poets described our creation by the hand of God. In both creation stories found in Genesis, both Genesis 1 and 2, there is an emphasis on God breathing life into us. In the first chapter, the author chooses a word that is typically translated as wind, something grander and more mysterious and more immortal than breath. But in the second chapter, the verses that we read today, we are told that God breathed into the nostrils of humankind the breath of life. The image of Genesis 2 isn't that far from modern-day CPR. God gives us God's own breath until we can breathe on our own and perhaps continues to share that breath even after we've gotten started. The Hebrew scriptures have two words for breath, nephesh and ruah. Nephesh, the word used in Genesis 2, is in addition to breath, primarily used to indicate what we now think of as soul. Ruah, likewise, is often translated as spirit. So when the Old Testament talks about breath, it is truly talking about not just the physical act of air entering and exiting our lungs. It's talking about our spirits and our souls. It's talking about our essences, the things that make us, us, our lives, physically and otherwise, are predicated on our breaths. Our breaths are our essences. Perhaps this is why Paul picks this same image of breathing when he addresses Athenians in today's reading from Acts. Echoing the Genesis passage, he refers to our creation by God and mentions that God gives everyone life and breath and everything else. And again, while it might seem like the reference to breath here is mainly establishing that we are living creatures, there's more going on. The Greek word for breath, pneuma, serves the same double function as the Hebrew. It means both breath and spirit. Paul is establishing that God gives us life in every sense of the word that our breathing is essential not only to our physical life, but also to our spiritual life. Two English words actually also capture this quality of breathing. The first is aspire, the verb we typically use to characterize someone who is shooting for the stars. It is a lofty and admirable word. The people who aspire to great things are the ones that we want to be like. They're the ones who achieve feats we hope to memorialize, to remember, to teach our children. People with great aspirations often become our role models and guides. We hope to aspire as they do. The word aspirate, of course, is just a synonym for breathe. 
when we aspire to greatness, it begins with our own godly breaths. The same is true for inspire. When we are inspired in the spirit, we are connecting to a holy breath. We are stoking an imaginative, creative life force. We are fanning the flames of our own souls, nephishes, pneumas, essences. In any language, our breathing is our life, not just physically, but emotionally, spiritually, sacredly. This is why, during especially times of chaos, it is so critical for us to breathe. We're doing it not only to continue distributing oxygen throughout our bodies, but also to continue feeding our souls. We are sustaining not only our God-created bodies, but also our God-gifted essences, the parts of us that edify and support, the parts that dream and sing, the parts that comfort and nurture. We become inhuman when we do not breathe. This is a significant part of what Paul is saying in the book of Acts. He's arrived in Athens solo, waiting for his traveling companions to join him, and the Athenians are turning on him quickly. They denounce him as a babbler and a lunatic, and while they are known for their discourse, Paul has encountered others who moved from talking to judgment to condemnation very quickly. He has a strong desire to make his case cleanly and persuasively. It makes sense that his appeal includes an emphasis on the universal breath. Watching election coverage, I was struck by Vanderbilt professor and Pulitzer Prize winner John Meacham, who made the same appeal. He started by mentioning, as others had, that we should conscientiously breathe, emphasizing that breathing is critical to our ability to heal. Anyone who has suffered an injury or soothed a crying child can identify with the idea that our first step toward healing is simply to breathe, to breathe deeply, to breathe purely, to breathe steadily, to breathe intentionally. It's how we get better. Meacham then added that breathing was at the root of our ability to communicate with one another. It's a time for us truly to speak and truly to listen to each other, he said. And again, our communication starts with our breathing. And as Meacham spoke, his own breaths were accentuated, enhancing his exhortation. Paul does the same thing in Athens. He communicates, demonstrating that he is listening, offering praise, valuing rhetoric, falling into rhythm. His words are his breaths, and he points out that his breaths are God-given, and in doing so, he gives his words the power to inspire, to assuage, and particularly to unify. One of the most challenging things about our past several months maybe even more than this year, although certainly especially this year, is that we are not breathing together. We should be united in our holy humanity through breath. We should be breathing in sync, breathing to lift each other up, breathing to calm each other in times of bedlam, breathing to motivate and to challenge, breathing together. Instead, we are breathing alone. In my previous setting, working as a youth minister, we would take the students to the beach every summer. One of their favorite parts of the trip came at night right before heading to bed. After a day that had been packed with games on the beach, heated discussions, stories and laughter, nonstop interaction, they would return to our meeting room and stretch out on the floor. We turn off the lights, and I'd ask them to relax, to close their eyes, to concentrate on each of their muscles as they individually grew heavy and slack, and to let go of the day. 
mirroring the man who'd taught me this, I'd ask them to inhale deeply, to hold their breath in their lungs while I counted to three, and to send the air inside them on its way. In the silent room, you could hear everyone's lungs join together in a collective act of focus and peace. Breathing is inhaling and exhaling, receiving and giving. Its very action requires us to be aware of our relationship to others. We need to breathe individually and collaboratively. Our spirits need to connect in this manner, the simplest and basest way imaginable. It has, of course, gotten a lot harder to do this. The youth beach trip didn't even happen this year. We can't gather in the same room and spread out on the floor and listen to each other inhale and exhale. We can't really gather anywhere, which grows more and more frustrating the longer it goes on. Even when we try to gather virtually, we live in an era where we are more divided than ever. The physical distance only exacerbates the other separation we experience to the point where we can't even breathe together. How do we bridge this gap? How do we learn to breathe together again? The connective tissue joining all of this, joining inspiration, aspiration, spirit, soul, essence, nurture, comfort, peace, focus, community, and breath is prayer. I can't help but wonder if this is at least in part why we often pray out loud. We need our breath to be part of our prayers. The story goes that Thomas Merton was being interviewed and was repeatedly asked about his monastic life in something of an intrusive way. The interviewer pressed, what do you wear? What do you do all day? How do you pray? An exasperated Merton responded, what I wear is pants, what I do is live, how I pray is breathe. His words connote the inherent connection between breath and the Holy Spirit. For Thomas Merton, the Holy Spirit was as present and constant as breathing. Perhaps part of the answer to those questions to how we bridge the gap and learn to breathe together again is to focus on these things. To pray as we breathe, sometimes acting consciously as we approach God, but often doing it without thinking. And to breathe as we pray, aware of the Holy Spirit in a way that forces us to be humble, aware of others, together, constantly, without breaking. That sounds beyond challenging to me. I can't really imagine praying as I breathe and breathing as I pray, and yet I trust and believe Merton when he says that this was his life. I know that with the model of heroes like Merton and with the help of others, it can be done. One question I've been asked multiple times during the past several months is to highlight a positive memory that has come out of 2020. There are actually several that I could name, but my mind tends to seize upon the same image every time. Back in March, on a clear spring night, my daughters asked if we could take a nighttime stroll through the neighborhood. We slipped out of the house just before bed walked down the street. This was when almost everyone was staying home, so there was no traffic even beyond our neighborhood on the typically busier roads, and as a result, it felt later than it was. We stargazed, pointing out constellations and Venus. We marveled at the brightness of the moon and the silence of our surroundings, and we breathed. I wouldn't have stepped out of the house on my own. I needed others to nudge me, to encourage me to breathe. 
without the encouragement, we will stop breathing on our own. At this morning's beginning, I mentioned most of the reasons why my daughters like dance. It speaks to them on a physical, mental, and social level, something that appeals to every part of their respective characters. What I failed to mention is how much joy it brings them. They were dancing in our living room long before the virus forced them to do so because they are sashaying and pirouetting almost everywhere they go. It is the way they move when they are filled with the spirit. They've continued going into the studio, having their temperatures checked, keeping their distance, wearing their masks. The breathing is a little bit of a challenge, perhaps something that they are a little more aware of, but they are still capable of drawing air in and letting it out. They are filled with the spirit. When I asked my daughter, Caroline, about wearing the mask all day and still being able to breathe, she shrugged her shoulders and said, you get used to it. She spoke simply and nonchalantly, but her words spoke volumes about pursuing the things that truly bring us joy, about doing them in a way that is sacred and inspired and humbled and prayerful and about maintaining consistency in our approach to these things. Pray as we breathe. Breathe as we pray. Do it enough. We'll get used to it. We find ourselves in a world where breathing may be a bit more of a challenge. It's certainly a world where we're more aware of the act of inhaling and exhaling, but we are still capable perhaps more capable than ever before, precisely because we are more intentional about our respiration. We are certainly more in need of breathing, breathing consciously, breathing to find peace in the midst of chaos, breathing to find joy, breathing to communicate with one another, breathing to heal, breathing to pray. It is a need we cannot afford to ignore. We are in need of breathing to be filled with the Spirit. Wherever you are worshiping and wherever you go from here, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his countenance to you and may you be filled with the peace of God. Amen.